Well, good morning. I heard one person. That's right. Don't you hate when people do that from stage? You know. Anyway, um, hey, it's good to see you. It seems to me like each week we get a little more, a little more people back. And this morning we are welcoming back uh, a portion of our students. A portion of our children have some child care provided as we're easing back into uh, child care here. And so, if you have a, a three-year-old a to six-year-old, there is full hour care. You can go right to the children's ministry there, and they will give you a place for your child. And we also have a family-friendly room across the hall in Community Room 1. We encourage you to avail yourself of that if you need to. Your family's welcome in here. And so um, we realize it's different times, and so we're coming back with a lot of flexibility. We are working on continuing and moving towards more child care as we go through the weeks. Hey, the challenge has been simple. It's been volunteers. Uh, it's not a desire or a fear. Um, it's really a, an issue of volunteers. We know that some volunteers, and many of our volunteers, have been hesitant to return back in, and so uh, we respect that, but uh, we do need children's ministry volunteers. If you'd like to help out with that, we would love to have you at our 1030 hour in particular. So a couple things I do want to announce is uh, our LH Youth, Living Hope Youth, are back uh, tonight. 7.30 to 9, uh, grades 6 through 12. We encourage you to be part of that. And uh, next week, our food pantry, and really up and through the 20th or any time, but we're going to specifically emphasize a food drive. That food drive is uh, to really uh, replenish what's been there. Our primary source of receiving food was through Phil Abundance. They have been overrun, so they've been limited in what they can provide us. But our new food pantry, we're going to celebrate it next Sunday, and we're going to celebrate it back across the parking lot with a food drive in the service, so we encourage you uh, to be part of that. We, we've included a list of things you can and give towards that, but really, uh, we appreciate that. And then our young adults are returning um, Wednesday evening, 7.30 Check our website. Um, check uh, the calendar on our website, and uh, they're beginning on the 23rd. Men's Cornhole Tournament is coming up. It's not just a competitive event. It's an opportunity for men to gather. They're going to be in the parking lot. Looking forward to just getting people here on site and being able to do those things. And so we encourage you, you can be part of that as well. And then as we get into October, we'll have some more events, and we're excited about that. We want to welcome you here today. If you're new, you're our guest. We want to welcome you here, and we invite you to our website and as well to um, see what Living Hope is about, to meet you. And there's a connection card uh, connection piece on our website in which you can return some information about yourself. Hey, before we get into uh, the message, just one note. If you do have children in the service with you and you want to avail yourself of a what we call a child uh, packet a, um, for them to do some things during the service, I believe we do have them back at the entrance. The greeters can help you with that. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to worship together, to be here together, to um, maybe have learned in a new way that we don't want to take this for granted. Scripture says not to forsake the assembling together. We don't want to do that, God. And so while we have wonderful opportunities of technology for those that are sharing, that are viewing online right now, we totally respect that. But I pray that you would continue uh, to grow our number and grow those that are here on site. We can be encouraged to see each other's faces and be able to uh, to even pray for each other. I pray that you would bring a quick, quick end to the coronavirus, that there would be uh, unity within our country, and we ask for your peace, only your peace, that can bring that about. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, this morning, um, we're going to be doing, um, well, you know what? I'm going to announce this first because I put it up there. So we are starting next week in First Peter, and uh, this week I wanted to do a standalone, and I'm going to talk about that for a moment. But we're going to be in 1 Peter next week, and we're going to be beginning that as we do celebrate our food pantry opening and the expansion of the food pantry and that ministry. But I encourage you to begin reading through 1 Peter. 1 Peter is a book that is hope for Christians that realize that they are in a perpetual uh, place of being in exile. That If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, your citizenship is someplace else. So how do you have hope through all of this? Well, 1 Peter gives us a picture of that, and it's not just waiting for Christ's return. It's the reality that for you and I, um, that uh, we can live with hope despite what's happening around us. So we encourage you 
uh, to be part of that. Hey, this morning, I want to talk about the charged topic of social justice and uh, do it in a little bit of a different way, realizing that it's a huge topic. So f- please, um, as we take the next 30 minutes and then go into worship, that you understand that as I bring some things out, there are things that God has put on my heart. The term social justice has been uh, extremely polarizing. Politically, it's been something that for all of us, maybe some of us don't think of at all, uh, but we are scared about. We see tactics and we see approaches within society that cause us not only to pause, but to pull away from. And this morning, what I want to do is really speak about it from Scripture and point out a few things that for me, I've had to look at, be reminded of, and be challenged by, and that hopefully will change some things. That as you see things going on, that it's not a dividing point, it's more of a reality that we are people called to justice. And so we are grateful for what Scripture teaches us. So if you ask somebody, what is social justice? And when you look on a bunch of websites, when you look on uh, the internet, there are so many definitions. But there are four essential goals that happen with social justice within our culture. And we have to know what culture is asking for. Because social justice in and of itself is something that the Bible speaks of in a different way. And I'm going to delineate and hopefully give you a grid to use as you begin to look at this topic. But there are four essential goals. Human rights access, participation, and equity. Well, what are they? What do you mean? You know, what do you mean by that? Human rights, of course, are things that are outlined in our Constitution. Human rights are something that none of us would debate on, maybe to the extent of them, but they are things within our democratic culture and government that we raise a high value to. Some people have raised a tremendous high value to them, and they say, hey, you know what? When you infringe upon my human rights you know, and government overreaches in some way, I become an advocate for social justice in that way. Maybe it's about wearing a mask. Maybe it's about what a governor or a government can tell you to do. But then on the other side of it, there are those within um, racial injustice, within economic injustice, in all kinds of areas of injustice that would raise other issues. Access. There are those that would talk about social justice in areas of access, of education, health, um, economic Um, where they live, um, what they have access to, how they have access, the quality of those things. Also, participation. I would call this, and I phrased it in my notes, as an invitation into uh, what culture, society, or country offers you. And again, we're speaking totally on uh, probably a secular level, but there's not a lot of disagreement from Scripture into these things. You You might look and say, well, participation in education, yes, access to it. But participation in having a voice through voting, we've seen through a century of history through this country that there's been movement, and none of us would disagree with it. Who has voting rights? Who has participation in government and has a voice? And equity. Equity may speak to the economic side of of these things. And equity would be that there is a wide divergence in our world between the very wealthy and the very poor. No No matter what you see as the cause... We could, we could agree with the fact that <clears throat> there are those that have much and those that have little. And then the question is, is this right? Is it wrong? What do we do about it? <clears throat> As Christ followers, we are required to engage our culture. And we are required to engage our culture with the gospel. And the gospel is not separate from these things. The gospel speaks to these things. And that when we're given Scripture... Scripture may not give us, thus saith the Lord, this is exactly what you're to do in this situation, but justice was on the mind and heart of God and is communicated in Scripture. Just want to step through a little bit of Old Testament and New Testament references to it. Old Testament law, it says this in Leviticus 23. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. God wrote the law for Israel and he gave them specifics. Hundreds and hundreds of laws to say, here's how I want you to act. Here's what I want you to do. The law not just identified the right and wrong, sin and what pleased God, but 
It identified ways in which God's justice, love, compassion, God's mercy was to be conveyed to a culture around them. And for those that would harvest, the majority of people harvested, grow crops, had land. Land was something that was highly esteemed. He would say, leave the perimeter. Don't harvest everything. Because there are those that are going to be poor. It was an acknowledgement of poverty. It was an acknowledgement of those that needed something. Let them just come and pick up what you grew, what you have. Give it. Be intentional. The law reflected this in a number of ways. And it was God also telling Israel that when you look at me, I'm a God of justice, but oftentimes justice is defined by law, punishment, what's wrong. But justice defines what's right. Justice defines compassion, and it defines mercy, and it defines the very heart of God as a perfect symbol and a perfect example and conveyor of justice. So he gave this through the law. Israel also, God gave a message to corrupt kings of Israel. He says this in Jeremiah 22. This is what the Lord says. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow. And do not shed innocent blood in this place. When Israel was was building its nation, and whether they were corrupt, whether they were unrepentant, rebellion, rebellious, no matter what they were, God would speak directly to the kings, and Israel had a string of wicked kings. The prophet Jeremiah, who primarily, from an outward view, was a failure because nobody was listening to him, and God told him in advance, you're not going to get much of a response because the people are so wicked. He said, still preach my message, And what he told the kings is, you got to do what's right. You know what's right. Rarely in Scripture, rarely for the Christ follower, rarely for Israel was it about ignorance or not knowing what was right. It was about going back to their own selfish ways, rebellious ways, and saying, God, what do you want me to do about those around me? Well, Israel became an oppressor of its own people. There had been people that had been robbed, that experienced injustice, and they did not defend them. They did not stand up for them. There was violence to the foreigner, to the fatherless, and to the widow. There was the shedding of innocent blood, and the prophet saying to the kings first, you need to pay attention to this. But you have to pick up the theme through Scripture because in the New Testament, it's going, to be influ- it's going to be emphasized. The reality that what God was doing, he was doing through the individual. Did God want to use government for the good of people? Of course he did. Did God want to use the church? Of course he did. But the church is made up of individuals, redeemed individuals, that God would use. And much like Israel, he said, you need to be an instrument of justice. You need to be practicing justice. So even when the king, even when a wicked king heard these words from the prophet, the individual needed to be paid attention to or paying attention to those things because they needed to understand that they were called to the same life. It's not just pointing to the powers that be. And then from Jesus himself. In Luke 4, Jesus would quote Isaiah chapter 61. And Jesus was beginning his ministry and ministering to people. Jesus was identifying what he was about and his mission. And he says this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of of the Lord's favor. The interesting thing about this passage that Jesus has here is a passage that has an implication of a physical transformation. He says what? I want to proclaim the good news, the gospel to the poor. Proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Recovery of sight for the blind. That's transformation. He says I want to set the oppressed free. 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But just as much as it has a focus in on the reality of physical transformation. Because Jesus fed 5,000 at one time. Jesus healed those physically. Jesus met needs. Jesus gave things away. He provided for things. He healed people. It wasn't just a gospel that was focused on the spiritual transformation. Its priority was the spiritual transformation of your heart, your mind, your soul. Your relationship with God was to be restored. But the physical side of that was, was important, and it was to be highlighted. And he's telling his disciples, those looking, I am here to do that. Why does he have to do that? Because in pointing out the reality that Jesus would come to change a heart and transform a life, it's also to realize that the gospel has a deep-reaching implication into society. And that while somebody may not accept Christ, me serving the gospel, preaching the gospel, loving people, there is a sanctifying effect a redemptive effect on culture around us where the church should having that impact. Now, we admit for the history of the church in the United States, there has been overemphasis in certain areas. There's been periods of the church where the overemphasis on education. It's never bad to teach the Bible too much. It's never bad for people to learn the Bible too much. It's not, we're not saying that. But when the church became a primarily educational institution to teach the Bible, but was not reaching people around them physically to meet needs, it had a deficiency. When a church took up the social gospel to the place where it was focused in on the oppression or freedom from oppression or meeting physical needs, but wasn't teaching the word of God or preaching the gospel, there was a deficiency. You can have extremes on either side. But there has been a practice of the church speaking into and practicing the gospel, because at the core, the gospel does both. And the church speaking into economic injustice, speaking into societal injustice, racial injustice. If you read Acts 2, Luke says that the new believers began to gather together. And as they gathered together, they worshiped and they fellowshiped. They ate together. They took communion together. They had a bond in Jesus Christ. And as they did this, the result was that they were overwhelmed and what happened with them, they had everything in common to the place where what they had, they shared with someone else. So if someone had two coats, they gave one to someone else. Part of this was the economic justice to say, my life is not just about the material. And in fact, for the follower of Jesus Christ, the material has to be de-emphasized to the point that I'm willing to give it away. And the first place we give it away is to followers of Jesus Christ so that we care for each other's needs. Because the expectation is this. If I am not willing to care for the needs of another individual that's a follower of Jesus Christ, there's no chance that I'm going to reach out to the world that's in need around me. There's this long, beautiful history of Christians who lived out their biblical call to justice in the first century. The early church pro proclaimed the gospel in so many ways. They fought racism between Jews and Samaritans and Gentiles. They talked about, and Jesus introduced, the value of women in culture and the value of women within the church. And it preached against hostility and divisions in the church between races. And God says in Galatians, the Apostle Paul says, listen, there, from God's perspective, there, are, there aren't these divisions anymore. Is there order in society? Yeah, we're going to speak to that in a minute. But there's an order that God places in. But it's not a devaluing of one culture, race, or gender. And then it fought against the injustices in society. The first century church saw how the Romans practiced um, the discarding of newborn babies. Particularly when they were born female where they were blemished in some way with a handicap, literally on the outskirts of the town, there was human dumps. The church stepped into place and it rescued people. It rescued these babies, received them in, and raised them as their own because they were unwanted and they cherished them 
because they were living out the gospel. When plague ravaged the Roman Empire and people began to get sick and there was no cure for that, their own pandemic that happened much more frequently than we'd ever experienced. Many people, many Romans and many Christians, whoever they were, Jews, would run for the hills because for them, the sick and dying were a dangerous lot of people. You don't want to get infected. You don't want to lose your life because you want to care for or minister to, even if it broke your heart because of somebody that had leprosy or somebody had that plague or it was a sexual disease in some way. But there were these countercultural Christians that decided that they were going to come to the bedsides of those that were plagued with all of these things, whether it be sexual disease or whether it be leprosy or whether it be something that was killing off society and cultures and that they would treat them with dignity and they would help the sick and they would help the dying and they would help the poor and that the church ran into the mess. And there was even times, I'm sure, the church aligned itself with organizations, people, groups of people that were very different than they were theologically. And they said, we're, we're okay, we're helping the poor, we're following Jesus Christ's commands, we're in the midst of this. Jesus risked so much of his reputation because, why? He was a friend of sinners and he said, I'm going to get in the middle of the mess. Now the culture of the church down through history oftentimes was confused about what it meant to separate itself from the mess of the world. And Jesus said really clearly, you know, I don't want you to be, I want you to be in the world, but not of the world. I don't want you to identify, be careful. But he understood that if you're going to minister to people, you got to be with them. But maybe you, like me, times growing up, I had connections with church that identified themselves as separatists that said, not only are we going to disassociate ourselves with anybody, that doesn't follow Christ, we're going to disassociate ourselves with another church that might not think like us or have theological agreement like us. And that while the doctrinal purity needed to be maintained, there was certainly a place in which God wants us to connect with people, connect with groups, connect with those that need Jesus. In the 1980s, when the AIDS crisis was elevated across the world and we're battling it, Churches were battling the idea of how much do we get involved with this. And there were people that decided that, you know, I'm not going to get anywhere near this. Fear of physical harm, fear of association, fear of condoning sin, fear of all of that. And I'll tell you something. I don't know that that reflected the heart of Jesus in any way. Because Jesus said what? From the Old Testament, God has not changed. He's coming here to free people. And yes, we have to understand that freedom was an internal freedom. And we're going to look at that in a moment because I want to give you the distinguishing marks because right now there are groups in our country. There are debates within Christian church to say, who can I associate with? Can I be part of this event? Should I not be part of this event? Should I hold back? Um, And unfortunately, the political dividing lines have been the defining mark for the church when Jesus never mentioned politics once. And so understanding who we are means we have to understand how to navigate this. I wish I could give you five or six points that told you exactly what to do when these things come up, but there's a lot of division among us within the church. So I just want to give you a few things. So how do you distinguish between God's justice and a social justice that has gone rampant and reflects maybe things that are so opposed to Scripture or so opposed to what God is doing has become militant or hostile, has become a place where we go, that might hurt our reputation to associate with it. And I want to just encourage you, your connection to Christ, your personal connection with Him, your personal following of the Holy Spirit is the most important thing you could ever do, but I want to identify a couple of things here. Number one, I want you to identify the idea that freedom results from removing only external oppression is not God's justice. Why do I say that? Because much of what we see outside in a secular form is focused on removing 
external oppression. Now, but, but Al, you say, God didn't God say that was one of his goals? Of course. Someday Jesus is going to come back and he's going to conquer enemies. He's going to conquer governments. But how do you merge God's justice and the freedom he's offering with some of the things that we see in culture? Should I be part of protesting? Should I be part of those things that identify racial, gender, oppression, or those things that I, I want to see people freed from? Where do I go? Should I be afraid of that? And with social media, we get a sense of where people are and the struggle is. I'll just be honest. There's a younger generation in the church that's grappling with this in a different way. They think differently than me at age 54. They look and they go, well, you know what? I didn't grow up in the era of the church that you did, Al. I didn't have those clear delineations, and I'm appalled by what I see in culture. So maybe what they post on a social media where they go or what they associate with is different than my generation. There's also a philosophical and theological divide. Some of us from a theological standpoint are much more of the separatists and say, I will do nothing to associate with those that are doing this. We've got to be careful on both fronts. Because on both what we might call the liberal and the conservative approach to these are dangers that are an equal threat to the church and to Jesus Christ and the cause of Christ. But here's what I want you to know, and you need to identify this. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? God came to change hearts. He came to to change lives one by one. He did not forsake the physical needs. He did not forsake all of those. But God, when he sent Jesus to earth at his first coming, recognized that the rejection of Christ would be based on the fact that he's not the Messiah that the Jews wanted. That Messiah was going to change things physically. Jesus came here and said, I'm going to change hearts. But Jesus was involved in the very issues of society and became the defender of, of the oppressed, the poor, and they were the crowd that followed him. But he never changed his mission. But all real change comes from internal heart change. Years ago, I was watching a, um, you know, it, when politics, politicians have this hot mic moment, they're embarrassed, but somehow, you know, they have the microphone on and somehow it's, it picks up stuff that a politician's being really truthful in. And you go, wow, that's really what I want to find out what they say. And years ago, I was watching during, years ago, it was, it was actually prior to the 2016 election. Hillary Clinton was being interviewed, was going to be interviewed on stage for uh, an event among those who were taking up the cause of racial discrimination in our country and economic discrimination. And she was backstage and she was being talked to and being confronted by the very people that she was going to support that day. And they were telling her, you're not real in this. Here's your record. And they were pointing at her. And, and she in a moment, got very defensive, and she said, you know, listen, I can't change hearts. I can only do legislative change and political change. And that is the truth. When you and I focus on changing society purely or emphasize, overemphasize the change in society by politics and not passionately with the gospel, we are missing out. Because the gospel changes lives. And so if I lose my standing or my reputation in the cause of Christ because of my political standing in some form, I am missing out big time. And the cause of Christ is hurt because Jesus never waded in to politics so heavily that the gospel was de-emphasized because he knew where real change would happen, even to the Pharisees, even to the religious. He did focus in on people's physical needs, and he said, I'm going to give them hope, but that hope's going to be in Jesus. That's going to be in what my Father can do and the access to my Father that I'm going to give through my death and resurrection. But external oppression around the world, things like human trafficking, slavery, things like that, we have to pay attention to that. I was thinking back to the history of our country and, and how it's responded. And I was reading some history, and, and, and I, I wasn't really aware how the church had responded to the slavery issue in the 1800s. And it was amazing how there was a mixed reaction. That 
there were some churches that fundamentally and theologically believed that slavery was acceptable form and believed about the, the value of human life being varying. And it was amazing when you read what some southern churches adhere to and even some northern churches But there was a long stream of abolitionists coming from Europe that would focus in on the fact that they saw the Reformation happening in Europe and then brought to America was going to be through how we responded to those that were oppressed. And yes, it was people turning to Christ, but they saw that this plague inside the Christian church is that even the church can get corrupted by bad theology that was somehow supporting slavery and that People like William Wilberforce and Finney and Wesley, they fought against it and they came to and they said, we got to be careful because we can become distracted and disoriented by politics, by labels that are being elevated above the gospel and above Jesus Christ. And they spoke up against and they were part of freeing those that were enslaved in our country. And God used them in a great way. The church can have a tremendous impact, but it's got to step into the mess. It's got to step into the mess. Secondly, in, dis- in deciding where or how I navigate this social justice and God's justice thing, if your view of justice means removing or weakening authoritative relationships to accomplish equality, then it's not God's justice. When I was reading through what, what might be called, and, and stuff that I won't get into, but I was looking at South America and some of the what was called liberation theology and people that lived under oppressive regimes and how the church was supposed to function and what we would do. And it was amazing how the core of the gospel changed to what was liberating people physically. And it de-emphasized the spiritual internal change in the gospel. Today we see that in our culture. You might see the defunding of police or um, removing of government and all kinds of structures. The confusion over what that brings and what people are saying to bring about equality. But God never used this tactic to bring about equality. He didn't because he preached the equality and he taught about the equality of every human life in the reality that Jesus looked at every human life the same. And the starting point was... You're created by God. And that for us, we need to look at life that way and say God's creation. And that if I go from that vantage point, there will be the place in which I step into these issues. But understand the authoritative role in these relationships. Scripture upholds the family and the parental role. It's really clear. Children honor your parents. Parents, you are responsible for your children. And you are to give them a knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ and the gospel. That the family and parents play an important role. That government is to be regarded and respected. And when Paul taught it in Romans 13, he said, listen, government is there to protect and to identify the wrongdoer. And you shouldn't fear government, but government isn't always going to be, well, it's going to be corrupt many times. Because it's led by corrupt humans. And that for employers, even using the word slave and saying, respect that master, respect that employer as an employee, do diligent work unto the Lord. For the military, for law enforcement, under government, it's the same respect. Those structures give us an order of how things work and that God actually reveals himself in that order. That even in the Trinity, there is a picture of that order. And then in the church. The church is to function in a manner that shows order and that it provides that order. And it actually stems from a picture of the family. See, removing these structures does not produce freedom. These structures themselves are freedom producing. And so equality doesn't come by just giving freedom no matter what, and removing standards, but it's realizing it, that these can be used for the good within our society and culture. But there will be a conflict because if you choose to align yourself or get connected to some really good movements, you will find a conflict 
and what they say about these structures. And you have to define and say, Lord, I, I got to see where, how much and where and when I step in to these causes and be careful of that. You know, I was, I was thinking that when we, when we talk about the major issues that have been elevated in our country for a long period of time, the church, because we lived in a civil society and we lived in a society that somewhat morally more reflected Scripture, as it moved away from that in the 60s and 70s, what occurred, the church became how to respond in all of that. And it jumped up as more of a moral voice to what was identifying what was wrong instead of jumping in to where God asked us to be in caring for the vulnerable. It wasn't eliminating one for the other. It was just doing both. So oftentimes we need that guidance directly from God. What do I do about this? How do I jump into this? Isn't that the emphasis that Jesus talked about on an individual level? I want you led by the Holy Spirit. I want to be your guide. Yeah, I will give you pastors. I'll give you teachers. I'll give you leaders. I'll give you governmental leaders. But I want you to follow me. When you follow me, you will have the confidence that you're doing what I asked you to do. And you might draw the criticism of other people. I remember years ago, the church I was at was centered around Franklin Mills Mall, and there was a church um, or in the same area, and they did not preach the gospel. They did not have a gospel preaching theology. They did not look at that. But they wanted to really reach the homeless, and the debate became between some of us, and we didn't really make it a church event. Should we get connected? Or should we get connected with them? What should we do? And I remember thinking, well, but they want to reach the homeless. Come on, they want to do something here. There was a lot of homeless in that community. I remember back in 92 hearing what was happening with the Billy Graham crusade in, in the Philly area and that there was this conflict among churches who said, no way, it's way too ecumenical. Let's not get involved. Even though thousands would come to Christ. So churches openly said, we're not going to get involved because you're associating with this church or that church or those that don't have our theology. We've got to be careful. It's not as black and white and clear cut. Third thing, if your view of justice diminishes or fails to acknowledge truth that comes from a sovereign creator who's above all, then it's not God's justice. Now you might say, oh, you're preaching to the choir today. But can I tell you something? If you read the Old Testament, if you read the New Testament, if you engage Scripture in what it talks about the oppressed and when it talks about feeding the poor, the hungry, caring for the widow and the orphan, there is just as much indictment on those of us who have not paid attention to this on an individual and a corporate level as a church. See, I want to uphold Scripture and understand that, yes, apart from God's truth, we can go way off But even of those that know God's truth, there are times that we have focused so much on the truth, the teaching of the truth, the educating of people in the truth, doing that, that we have not been the hands and feet of Jesus in a culture. Job said in the midst of his trial, under the oppression that he was experiencing, when he had done nothing wrong, I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. What would happen to the church if the church became oppressed and persecuted because of what we believed? Would we follow God? Would we care for the poor? Would we acknowledge Him? Would we follow His truth? It says in the New Testament, all Scripture is God-breathed. It's useful teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for what? Every good work. There's a physical, tangible, intentional work that comes from knowing truth. Now, there are those that will not regard the Word of God as authoritative in their life. And there are going to be times we have an opportunity to align, get next to, be able to take up a cause with, and we've got to acknowledge that the messiness of that means it's an opportunity You can acknowledge the challenge. You can say, this is challenging, this is challenging, this is challenging. Oh, the fear. It's a slippery slope, this fear. How about this? The opportunity to rub shoulders with people and to give them the gospel and them to see you and the heart of who you are because many people will turn away from Christ in the church because they don't see the church jumping into this. It is so easy 
to become a church, a place where we are identified with, with what we're against, but we never show people what we're for. This became so apparent with the abortion issue in our country because under the abortion issue, it was so clear. No, we know what God upholds, the value of all life. And when he talks about the unborn life in the womb, it is clear. It is not debated. And we can say it so clearly, write it, and make it part of all of our theology statements and all of our doctrines of faith, and we can put it all there. But is the church willing to foster, adopt, get into that, provide for? No, because oftentimes we're so good at telling people what we're against and where sin is identified. Do you remember the deficiency in the law that was talked about in the New Testament? The deficiency of the law was that the law simply pointed to people's sin but didn't offer a real, redemptive, restorative place for people to come and know God. And the deficiency in truth that simply says, this is what God's against. We never tell people that God is for them, God loves them, and God wants to restore them is a gospel that's deficient. And that is not a reflection of God. Now, I could apply this to so many areas, but it challenged me as I said, well, what am I doing on an individual level? Folks, I really believe this, especially with the church shutting down. I was talking to somebody yesterday at our prayer event. If I am waiting for church to open up, for real ministry to begin, I have not read the Bible. If you are waiting for me, an elder, or anybody else to get ministry going, then you are living in isolation apart from your neighbors. That's where ministry is as a follower of Jesus Christ. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do ministry there, in your workplace, in your neighborhood. Reach out to your neighbors. That's what you're supposed to do. That's where truth is just as powerful as it is on this stage. Because God will use you in great ways. And the church has been challenged to go out. Last thing. If a view of justice is not restorative, then it's not God's justice. If a view of justice is not restorative, then it's not God's justice. This goes back to what I just said. If justice is just about where the evil is and how to identify it, but it's not about the solution that Jesus Christ offers and that it doesn't come out with compassion and love and mercy then what I'm doing is not showing the full gospel. Restorative justice equally advocates for seeking out the vulnerable rather than just punishing the evil. Saying, Lord, we're here. We are the best equipped to reach the vulnerable. We are the best equipped. And sometimes when we think of the vulnerable, we think of some extreme needs out there. You know, and I love the fact that Living Hope has, has we care, and students come in. This past week, I had some pictures taken of the kids in their own virtual little educational, 55 kids that needed supervision that can learn in this very confusing educational time for teachers and students and parents, and they're here on site. We're providing our building so that these kids can learn and have some normalcy in their life, so that children can be cared for, that our food pantry is expanding, that we're looking at the vulnerable and we're saying, we want more vulnerable, more vulnerable, more vulnerable, more poor, more hurting. And that's where the ministry is. But it doesn't just begin here and end here. It's very much part of your individual life. This is what Isaiah said, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's case. That's what Jesus said in the gospel, didn't he? So this morning, I'm going to invite the praise team up. I don't have all the answers for the complexity of social injustice in our world and the complexity of the solutions that are being offered out there and how the church should jump in. But I know this, we are not to be on the sidelines. We are being the lead. 
and I'm going to ask you to begin as an individual. Because as an individual, empowered by Jesus Christ, empowered by his Holy Spirit, given the mission of the gospel, you can talk to somebody about Jesus Christ. You may not be able to restore their marriage. You may not be able to fix their financial problems. You may not be able to deal with the mess that's in their life, whether self-inflicted or put upon them, but you can give the gospel. You can reveal the love of Jesus so that they can see something different because the greatest change will take place internally. And we can't be shying away from those messy situations. You have answers. Let God do the rest. Trust him. Don't try to figure it all out, overanalyze it. Share the gospel. And live in that gratitude to where you say, Jesus, you stepped into my mess. And you didn't ask me to clean up anything. You cleaned me up all yourself. Lord, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for the opportunity to be together and to love you and to serve you. Thank you for the challenge of the coronavirus. And hopefully, God, it's challenging us to new things, new behavior, new thinking, and that we can become people that are instruments of justice. God, we, we can't fix everything around us. But Lord, you've given us so much to do. I pray that we would start with our own families and we would start with our own neighbors. And that as we feel restricted here in this location, that our greatest celebration and our greatest victories would begin at home. If they begin at home in our neighborhoods, we will be limitless here at this place and in this community. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we close the service with some worship? Let's worship the Lord, whether you're at home. Let's sing praises to our good God.
far too short to sing his praise. You know, folks, we live life here on earth. It's described as a vapor. It's described as a mist. It's described as not guaranteed, right, whether we'll have tomorrow. But we can know for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that we will be with Christ in the kingdom and for an eternity be in glory with him. Amen? That is the assurance of your salvation. And if you don't have that assurance of salvation that when you take your last breath here on earth, you will be in the presence of God. To be absent from the body is to be present with Christ, right? If you don't have that assurance, don't leave here today without talking to someone. Someone that was up on stage, Pastor Al, to hear the gospel, to know it's not just a story, it is the power for salvation. I want to just quickly read a few verses in Psalm 139 as I was reading through this this morning. Uh, take courage in how the Lord knows us. This is what David says. He says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my paths and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. If I say surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night even the darkness is not dark to you the night is bright as the day for darkness is as light with you for you formed my inward parts you knitted me together in my mother's womb I praise you Lord for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made wonderful are your works my soul knows it very well let's continue in worship
justice is yours, declares the Lord. We thank you that in your name we can declare the greatest message known to man, the transformative work, Holy Spirit, that you do within an individual. It's not just emotion, Lord. It's not fake. It's not pretend. It's not just tradition. It's transformation. It's restoration. So we praise you for the gospel. May it always be on our lips, on our hearts on our minds. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Have a good week. In tenderness, she saw